I wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Rebecca Monion. Uh, I am an undergraduate student uh, studying emergency administration and planning, which is within the College of Health and Public Service here at UNT. Over the past year and a half, I have been an undergraduate research fellow under the advisement of Dr. Mary Nealon. And today I will be covering the research that I have conducted during my fellowship titled the Adaptive Recovery Management Cycle. I will provide you with a brief background on my research topic along with its purpose. Uh, I will cover the literature review and then move on to the data and methods I used to develop the results of the study. And lastly, I will explain the results along with the discussion and limitations that formed throughout the study, which um, after which I will answer any questions that you have. The first portion of the presentation will cover the background purpose and the literature review. So we'll move along to that. To give a little bit of, little bit of background on the research topic, um, the United States government has utilized adaptive management approaches to address complex environmental resource issues since the 1980s. However, in 2018, the EPA began establishing these adaptive management programs across all 1,335 Superfund sites spanning across the U.S. Superfund sites are often established in the weeks and months following a disaster and therefore fall under the recovery phase of the disaster life cycle due to the rapid emergence of adaptive management programs in disaster recovery, the field of emergency management has been largely affected. This study investigates the challenges that have arisen to, uh, to conceptualize and develop a new systematic framework that emergency management practitioners may utilize to improve the effectiveness of disaster recovery operations. The main purpose of the study is to increase the understanding of how emergency managers can be more effective and efficient during disaster recovery by utilizing adaptive management approaches. Despite the breadth of research on disaster recovery, it remains the least structured and understood aspect of the disaster life cycle, which makes this research imperative to the field of emergency management. Um, diving into the literature review, I studied three topics, uh, disaster recovery, adaptive management, and adaptive management challenges. To learn more about disaster recovery, I reviewed the National Disaster Recovery Framework outlined by the Department of Homeland Security, along with the textbook, uh, Disaster Response and Recovery Strategies and Tactics for Resilience, written by David McIntyre. Within these texts, uh, we see that disaster recovery prioritizes human health, safety, and livelihood. And that as disaster severity increases, we have also seen an increase in emergency management innovation. Moving on to adaptive management, I utilize the US Department of Interior's technical guide and application guide to, um, that they have created for adaptive management. It outlines that adaptive management is a systematic approach that learns through the practice of management itself while adjusting program objectives as understanding improves. While these adaptive management programs are established, they have recognizable limitations when applied to complex sites and affect large and diverse populations because it is mainly utilized for environmental resource issues. These limitations are the basis of uh, my paper and research, which considers transforming components of these programs to create a new management cycle that is better suited for disaster recovery operations. The chief operating officer at the Department of Interior recognizes these challenges as she notes that we can look towards the field of sociology to increase adaptive management human health considerations. Due to this, I reviewed literature on the rational action theory, a resilience activation framework, and protective action decision model to give informational context on social complexities. 
Uh, now that we have identified the issue and become informed on the topic, we can move into how the research was conducted. To investigate these issues, I examined traditional adaptive management programs that are used on disaster recovery sites by proposing two research questions. First question being, what challenges are experienced when adaptive management programs are utilized in, emergency, in the emergency management field, specifically on disaster recovery sites? And the second question, how can emergency managers utilize aspects of emergency management to increase the effectiveness and efficiency during disaster recovery operations? I chose the Gold King Mine Wastewater Spill Disaster to be the disaster of study due to its complex nature. The event occurred on August 5th of 2015, just north of Silverton, Colorado, when an EPA worker unintentionally caused the mine the mine's uh, channel to fail. This set off a rapid outpour of over 3 million gallons of toxic wastewater into the Animus River. The toxic plume traveled downstream across four state lines, impacting nine urban municipalities, three indigenous reservations, and hundreds of miles of rural communities. The EPA struggle to manage the response and initial recovery of this event as it spans across two EPA regions and multiple state jurisdictions. Since the event, uh, recovery efforts have ensued. The Bonita Peak Mining District Superfund site was established the following year and was then placed on the national priorities list. Therefore, uh, making the Bonita Peak Mining District Superfund site a long-term recovery operation of the Gold King Mine Wastewater Spill Disaster. Data was collected um, throughout field op through field observations and conducting semi-structured interviews with five stakeholders. Um, as we see in the outline process, I, I identified the Bonita Peak Mining District by searching the national priorities list I was then able to identify the site stakeholders and letter of consent um, was obtained from the community advisory group chairman. Um, this allowed me to participate in a stakeholder meeting and interview the uh, committee representatives. I then obtained a IRB approval from the university and then traveled to Silverton, Colorado for a meeting on uh, September 25th of last year. I collected field observations and scheduled the interviews. And then over the course of the week, I completed the interviews, um, which I audio recorded and then transcribed and analyzed um, the data. Let's see. Okay, so um, from the collected data, two thematic um, categories emerged. The first um, had to do with inclusion the stakeholders were dissatisfied with the federally operated adaptive management programs because the structure did not ensure that the program's decision makers were inclusive of all impacted communities when analyzing disaster recovery issues. And then secondly, over perceived impacts, the stakeholders and field observations identified the need for disaster recovery solutions to be designed to address communities' perceived impacts along with scientific impacts. To go a little more uh, in depth on inclusion, the findings revealed that urban communities were well represented uh, during the adaptive management decision-making phase, while rural communities lacked representation and inclusion. Rural communities that were uh, specifically identified were indigenous tribes, farmers, and private well water users along the Animas and San Juan rivers. Um, this quote from a stakeholder represents the lack of inclusion of rural communities during the decision-making process. Um, the data also revealed the lack of inclusion eventually led to information gaps um, of community and cultural needs following the Gold King Mine Wastewater Spill Disaster. These gaps 
resulted in decision makers implementing ineffective disaster aid among rural communities because perceived impacts among these com multicultural communities were not considered during the decision making process. One stakeholder mentioned uh, this quote um, and um, it represents that the cultural difference between decision makers in rural communities created a social rift. Um, and um, a comment by a stakeholder that resonated with me was um, perception is reality. Um, if we contemplate that perception to be reality, decision makers left a marginalized, um, the marginalized communities with unaddressed harms. From these thematic categories, um, we can begin to see the need for disaster recovery to be able to address the implications that arise due to social complexities. I utilize these outline challenges to conceptualize and develop the adaptive recovery management cycle. The uh, ARMC for short integrates traditional adaptive management programs with disaster life cycle concepts to provide disaster recovery with its own systematic framework. It is, it is designed to increase the collaboration and communication among all impacted communities and cultures to analyze disaster recovery issues in greater detail before designing and implementing recovery aid initiatives. Uh, due to the, the diverse and complex economic, ecological, and social implications that are involved with disaster recovery, the ARMC finds its strength in establishing a structural approach that adapts um, recovery initiatives around multicultural needs as information accrues. The ARMC is in alignment with the National Security Strategy, Department of Homeland Security's National Preparedness Goal, and the National Disaster Recovery Framework as it has the ability to address human, social, political, and economic capital needs. Um, going into the um, different phases of the um, adaptive recovery management cycle, the purpose of establishing a team as the initial action is to determine team roles, responsibilities, and priorities. This will create a well-structured process of recovery problem solving. Um, I utilize the incident command structure because it's well known um, in the field of emergency management and therefore can be um, widely applied. Um, one previous uh, identified challenge with the traditional adaptive management program is that decision makers often overlook analyzing the recovery problems in depth before designing recovery solutions. So to overcome this issue, the ARMC will replace the decision making phase with two separate steps, analysis and design. During the analysis phase, the ARMC team will gather the information from all impacted communities um, and then by prioritizing inclusion practices during the information gathering process, the ARMC decision makers will be able to improve interest alignment among all impacted communities when designing disaster aid uh, initiatives. Um, and then going into the design phase after the information is gathered from all impacted communities, we can then move into the design phase to create the recovery initiatives. The recovery initiatives that is designed must incorporate measures of equality to support the scientific impacts as well as the perceived impacts among communities. After designing an initiative, the ARMC team will use the implementation phase to activate their initiative among the impacted communities active communication between the ARMC team and the representatives of all impacted communities will ensure multicultural compliance and operational success. Um, during the monitoring phase, uh, data will be collected on the development of the recovery initiative and the team must identify and annotate the positive and the negative consequences of the initiative 
while collecting field observations. This data will then assist the ARMC team to further um, improve recovery initiatives in the future. In the evaluation process, the team will bring together all information approved during the previous ARMC phases to assess the recovery initiative. Outputs and outcomes will be addressed to determine the effectiveness and efficiency of the initiative's inputs. To ensure objectives are met, data will be disseminated in both quantifiable and qualitative terms. Um, and it is important to consider how the current outputs of the initiative will lead to future outcomes of um, and outline new reoccurring issues. Lastly, the adjustments will be made to um, based on the gathered information. As the process completes its recursive cycle, the ARMC team will bring in new collaborators and they will begin to further analyze the, um, the recovery issues among the communities. Um, this study investigates how to improve the effectiveness of disaster recovery by providing it with a systematic framework. I examined this objective by proposing two research questions and following through with collecting and analyzing data. Conclusively, the research illustrates that traditional adaptive management programs are failing to be effective and efficient when applied to disaster recovery sites, largely due to the program's inability to address the influx of social complexities that are involved with disaster recovery operations. Previous research has focused on the rebuilding of damaged structures and economic restoration. However, the management of disaster recovery needs to address all the capital needs required for individuals and communities to fully recover from disasters. Therefore, this study shows the importance of addressing the perceived impacts of a community, as well as scientific impacts recognized by the adaptive management decision makers. As I saw that there were different interests among multicultural disaster sites. The limitations of this research um, are that the sample size is relatively small and the field observations are prone to bias. Uh, however, to give a baseline understanding, I believed ethnography approaches were important due to its nature to improve understanding of social complexities and inequality among community groups. Um, so further research should expand the sample size to include more disaster sites that utilize adaptive management um, by designing a quantifiable survey that will increase the sample size. Uh, this data will be used uh, to further alter the adaptive recovery management cycle so it is more inclusive and represents additional issues seen within disaster recovery. And a um, few acknowledgments, um, my mentor, Dr. Mary Nealon and the Department of Emergency Management and Disaster Science. Oh, by the way, that was very well done. I really, I especially like the, the deck. It was very well crafted. Uh, so we'll get to the questions at the end. Uh, who, uh, who's next? Okay. Uh, I can't hear you. Hi. Oh, there you go. Okay. So brief introduction, I'm Kelly Parton. I am a senior undergraduate anthropology student. I've been doing this research under the direction of Dr. Jared Carrington. Um, my paper is quite long, so I've tried to condense the main thrust of my argument you know, within the time frame here. So. so the topic today is in prison therapeutic communities, which I'll refer to as TCs for short. Therapeutic communities are an intensive residential treatment style that have over the past 30 to 35 years been integrated into criminal sentencing determinations and correctional facilities. Conceptually, these programs offer an opportunity for drug rehabilitation services for criminal offenders who've been assessed to have a substance abuse disorder and or have been charged or finally convicted of a drug related crime. The ideal product, if you will, of these programs would be someone who considers only themselves the cause of their problems and has used what the code would call self technologies or in other words self help techniques to transform themselves at a deep level into an ideal citizen. 
one of the goals of this type of program is to responsibilize individuals or make people take responsibility for themselves or situations and ultimately refute problems of social or economic inequality as influences on their drug use or involvement in crime. Generally, neoliberal discourses that encourage responsibility taking as a means of personal success hinge on appeals to individual freedom, promises that anyone can have a better quality of life if they put the work in and so on. My question is, how can a program like the TC assume to work in a situation where individuals are denied complete agency and are later barred from full citizenship by stigmatization, criminalization, and other barriers to personal success? And more to the point, how can we reconcile a program that promises positive transformation in a correctional institution that is characterized by repression, discomfort, and fear? So I used discourse analysis and drew primarily from Foucault's Discipline and Punish, as well as Donna, Donna Haraway's Situated Knowledges. I argue that imprisoned TCs do not work to transform individuals so much as discipline them, using fear of loss of control over their futures to leverage participation. To illustrate how discipline works here, I'm going to give a brief description of one of the core practices the program uses, and then put it into the context of uh, the knowledge that offenders have and also the legal and social pressures that influence offenders' choices to participate. And I'm really intending to provide an alternative mechanism for responsibilization, responsibilization here and explain how and why the majority of program participants do the program by faking it to make it without putting their faith in it. I conclude that these programs do not produce responsibilized, transformed people so much as responsibilized individuals in a literal sense when participants come to understand that, like, what they must do to successfully complete the program. And finally, I argue that these programs do not provide the tools or resources to address the material and social needs of offenders, but leave them perhaps worse off than if they had only been in the general prison population. The primary sources of data come from the writings on TC theory and uh, the model by George de Leon, a program handbook given to in-prison TC participants and online message boards for offenders and their families. I selected message board posts from prisontalk.com on the subject of SAFE-P, which is an acronym for Substance Abuse Felony Punishment, and IPTC, In Prison Therapeutic Community. These are in prison TCs that from 1992 to around 2015 were run by the Gateway Foundation in Texas, which has the largest TC, in prison TC program in the United States, a combined 7,200 beds. The manual wasn't from a Texas program, but it was from a Gateway Foundation prison TC that was run in Maryland. Um, or Maryland Treatment Center. So this is how this whole situation works. Individuals enter an in-prison TC at sentencing because they have been, they have violated pro probation or parole or as a condition of release on parole. It's understood that failure to complete the program either by deciding to quit or breaking rules to the point that one is expelled can and does lead to extended prison time. Further, entering the program is often presented as one of two choices. The options are structured so that opting into the program, if one is given a choice, is the most promising option, e.g. choosing between five years in prison or six to nine months in the TC. And I wanted to delve further into the subjective experiences of participants and how they make sense of the program, how this influences their behavior in response to the program protocols. I learned that individuals are exposed to anecdotal accounts of the program modality itself, thanks to both sharing stories in jails and prisons and the revolving door aspect of recidivism. To cite one prisontalk.com user, quote, out here in the free world and in prison, we call it the snitch farm, end quote. So I find that offenders are already critically assessing their situation and deciding how best to navigate the program structure even before entering the program proper. As for snitching, the most important aspect of a TC model is community as method, meaning by design, participants themselves are integral to the program structure. And undergirding this, treatment model is a set of ideas about a person with a substance abuse problem. TCs consider drug abuse and addiction as correlates of a disordered personality. In the words of De Leon, quote, the problem is the person, not the drug, end quote. The TC view of the addict is a person who's irresponsible, manipulative, immature, lazy, morally destitute, and more. And accordingly, the program is designed to address these problems through what the TC calls mutual self-help, a strategy that's supposed to make individuals more accountable. And this is how it works. Upon entry, an offender is given a handbook and assigned a big brother or big sister who introduces them to the TC culture, including its rigorous rules and schedules. Once a person understands the rules of the TC, which include things like how to walk, how to sit, those are called props in the program, 
make their bed, raise their hand to speak, so on, and move into a second phase of treatment where they are required to survey their peers. If another inmate is violating a rule, they must verbally correct them by saying pull up on XYZ, for example, pull up on not walking in props, or then write down the instance of rule breaking on a piece of paper and drop that into a box. These are called encounter slips. They're sorted by program staff or senior program participants and then used in a group called the encounter group where the observer confronts the rule breaker for their rule violating behavior. This also establishes a record of participation that is communicated to sentencing judges. Every single participant in the TC is required to pull up or encounter their peers for observed rule violations. In fact, to not write up a peer for an observed infraction is its own rule violation. And in order to be considered successful in this program, one must consistently write up other participants for rule breaking. In Discipline and Punish, Foucault writes about how panoptic surveillance is used to make prisoners internalize discipline. In Power Knowledge, he writes, quote, they thought people would become virtuous by the simple fact of being observed, end quote. And I'll add, being unsure of when or by whom. In the in-prison TC, each participant is also their own mobile node of panoptic surveillance. The difference is that power in this instance is both visible and verifiable, and it's also all-encompassing. Put this in some context here. Um, in, a, in, prison, uh, in a prison dormitory, which is the primary housing type used in in-prison TCs, there's absolutely no opportunity for privacy. Individuals are housed with up to 100 other people. This effectively reduces what Foucault calls the coefficient of improbability to nil. There is nearly no chance that breaking a rule will go unobserved and unpunished. Hence, following the rules becomes a matter of expediency. Here's a quote from a prisontalk.com user that really illustrates how important it is for program participants to demonstrate compliance. And in this case, this is when they're faced with a collective punishment called the shutdown, which is where you sit in these chairs from morning to night silently saying nothing for several days. It's purportedly been discontinued, but sources argue that it's only been renamed because it was construed as torture. Open quote. Once in shutdown, the staff and counselors tell you that only you have the power to get them to lift the shutdown. One day they came in and opened the little box where everyone placed their write-ups on other inmates. Due to the fact that we spent all day, every day, sitting silently in chairs without speaking or moving, there weren't many write-ups. The counselors erupted in rage, screaming that we were covering up each other's crimes, and if they didn't see a big change tomorrow, the shutdown would go on for longer than we thought possible. People were scared to death, so they started writing each other up for made-up stuff. And things like closing their eyes or crossing their ankles while on the chairs, which is a no-no. The next day, the box was overflowing. Counselors enraged if we had this many slips and then our behaviors were out of control and the shutdown would be extended even longer. This type of thing went on over and over and over. So as you can see, the in-prison TC works more by sticks than by carrots. There aren't really many opportunities to provide positive incentives in a prison setting. And more generally, prison is damaging, socially, economically, physically, and interpersonally. And as I've mentioned, the costs of quitting or acting out are incredibly high. And then when we consider the marginalization that goes hand in hand with both crime and drug use, it is clear that promises of TCs to transform individuals and give them cool tools to recover vis-a-vis -vis becoming responsible or accountable just don't hold water. Therefore, it seems unnecessary to resort to questions of deep transformation to explain why, part, why inmates participate when they don't accept the program's interpretive framework, that they are less than, they're addicts, or that a deep amount of personal work will allow for success. In fact, it's often the promises of the TC or the TC's treatment approach that trigger internal resistance to the program structure and ideology. And as I pointed out, the vast majority of offenders enter the program with some kind of prior knowledge of the, quote, snitch farm. The conventional mainstream, as De Leon puts it, so often is already out of reach of people who enter these programs. They face barriers of social and economic inequality, racism, sexism, classism, and more. And then after release, the stigma associated with criminals and especially drug offenders compounds existing systems of discrimination. Moreover, the ideal recovered subject as described by uh, Lynn Haney is a highly racialized, classed, and gendered concept. It's white, it's middle class, and it's male. To put this in perspective, the TC's neoliberal concepts promise something that is out of reach or impractical to most offenders who are already excluded by virtue of their criminal record. Of course, none of this is to say that drug offenders don't view criminality or drug use is problematic, but they understand what they need. Only a small portion come to believe that TC treatment structured ideas of an addict personality, its concept of recovery, or personal responsibility for societal failings. 
majority enact responsabilization because that's the only way left to maintain control. Drug offenders enter these programs with real anxiety about the consequences of their legal situation, their finances, and a desire for vocational training or education. But in the TC, they're denied everything but a GED course. And otherwise, it's groups all day. In a cruel catch-22, program graduates are put on probation or parole, which requires employment and payment of fines and fees to stay out of prison. Studies show that up to 65% of employers would never knowingly employ someone with a criminal record. Offenders understand this as well and often choose to stick through the program in hopes that it will make them look better to future employers, CPS, their families, et cetera, in addition to avoiding the legal ramifications I mentioned earlier. But why does this matter? <laughs> Safe P, IPTC, and programs like them push thousands of people through them in a year. Other scholars have emphasized how the program rhetoric is damaging, demoralizing, dematerializing, and is designed to convince offenders of a deep personality flaw that is the cause of their drug use meaning that should they relapse, they have only themselves to blame. It's a fascinating kind of circular logic. And what I'm, what I'm offering to the conversation is another critique of the program structure. So often states use graduation rates and recidivism rates to justify continuance of the program. But if we can see how the program is actually working in practice by using coercion, punishment, and discipline in a context of complete and total surveillance, this really highlights that these programs aren't suited for addiction treatment at all. They're disciplinary institutions par excellence. This type of work is exactly what Foucault would push for, asking questions of power to understand how it works and then to use that knowledge to challenge institutions and structures that fail us. Safe P and IPTC are failures. Around two thirds of program graduates recidivate in the next few years. And even then my research and that of others might, be, might point out that not recidivating doesn't exactly translate to recovery as the treatment program promises. And then we could say that we should return to a more rehabilitative style of treatment that addresses offenders' stated needs for education or transferable job skills. But I argue that the prison is not a place to heal or recover. I'm gonna end with this quote. This is not the best practice, but I must glue this. This quote sums up how this program is failing people at a very basic level. Again, citing a prisontalk.com user. Quote. If I behaved out here the way I was taught to behave in there, I would never help anyone, never comfort anyone. I tell every friendly coworker that I was there to work, not make friends. I keep a notebook full of sins committed by everyone I knew so I could tell on them. I would blindly accept any awful thing done to me because acceptance is the answer. I tell my family they were getting in the way of my recovery. I'd break up with my boyfriend if I had one because you shouldn't be in a relationship for the first year. And if I insisted I wanted to stay with him, I might find myself getting an extension in the program. There's a big difference in obeying the law and the things that you can say to be. And that's my conclusion there. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I apologize. I am an anthropologist. Specifically, I'm a, a political anthropologist. So uh, the, the topic that you, you just presented on is something that I taught a long time. Uh, so uh, um, very interesting stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, we have one more person, and then we're going to go for questions and uh, discussion, okay? Okay, hello. My name is Danielle Quintanilla. I am also a senior undergraduate anthropology student. I also am a history student, and um, so I've kind of combined a bit of the two of those in my work that I did under the mentorship of Dr. Jared Carrington. Um, my research focused on Chinese ethnoverbs and the integrated ethnic economy as a study in community patterning within the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. So I began looking at archival research, um, primarily local DFW newspapers um, from the late 1800s to the 21st century that were regarding the Chinese American community within DFW, and also looking at some academic literature on the topic, although there's very little actually on Chinese Americans with, within Texas, and especially not in North Texas. They typically focus on Houston and San Antonio. Um, but uh, contrary to what many people might think, there were Chinese people here as early as the late 1800s as they were in California. It was just a lot smaller numbers. So there was never the actual formation of um, true ethnic enclaves really anywhere in Texas uh, for Chinese people. There were no, there's a quote from a, um, one of the pieces I found from the 70s where he straight up says, there are no Chinatowns anywhere in Texas, and it's repeated throughout a lot of the literature around this time. Um, there's exactly two that were ever recognized and none of them exist anymore. Um, however, there still 
are um, communities of Chinese people, people of Chinese heritage within North Texas. Um, but the primary narrative is that they have somehow assimilated into the rest of American society and that um, there's really no need to talk about it because there is no significant community in that way. Uh -oh. uh, no verbs, at least in DFWs. Um, that, and what I mean by ethnoverb as, um, it was first came up as a term to describe uh, the communities in Monterey Park, uh, which were completely different really from the traditional Chinatown pattern that was in nearby LA. And Flushing as well was another one of these neighborhoods, um, uh, kind of an offshoot of the New York City Chinatown. And these neighborhoods and specific, specifically, they were uh, affluent residential suburbs that were purposely sought out by uh, Chinese immigrants who were quite well off. Um, and they were attractive because they promised a lot of economic opportunity and they essentially gave them room to grow uh, into American society rather than um, feeling segregated off, whether by their own choice or by being forced there. Um, and I feel this term is most appropriate for the um, communities that we have here in DFW because um, there are, it's the same story. They're patterned into uh, these neighborhoods, but they're not in a ghetto sense or in a enclave. Um, Richardson, Plano, and Frisco are three of the major ones that were pointed out to me that I found in archival research and also in talking to people. Because once I kind of found the, what I was looking for, for in my archival research and seeing what the history was, the most common thread I saw was um, the economic opportunities. The search for that is always a huge driver of immigration and specifically for Chinese immigrants to DFW. Um, that was certainly the primary factor in why they settled where they did and in the ways they did um, in these more affluent areas that promised that they could uh, start their own business, that they could join a huge tech company, that they could go to college and then do that, um, and that they had great schools to put their kids in. Um, so then, of course, this still seems like, well, they must be assimilated because they're moving into neighborhoods. And uh, one of the key characteristics of an ethnoburb is that you don't even need um, to have a majority population of the particular ethnic group in question. All of these ethnoburbs of Richardson, Plano, and Frisco can technically be called ethnoburbs of Chinese, popu of Chinese populations, but also Japanese populations, Korean populations. It applies to many people. So in that sense, it doesn't really seem like it's significant in that way. Um, but I still argue that it's really not assimilation in the traditional sense. It does blur the boundaries of the communities as there is no majority population. Um, but there's not a dissolution of ethnic identity um, and kind of leaving that behind as we traditionally think in uh, classical assimilation. Really there's very purposeful seeking out of co-ethnics. Um, once I moved out of archival research, I went into participant observation and informal interviews to kind of figure out how the community was bounded and maintained. And what I found was really um, this only physical spaces that you have um, to interact with the community uh, when it's in an ethnoburb form is actually through economic means. Um, when you're not, when you're outside of the ethnic enclave and you leave behind that, the ethnic enclave also has an ethnic economy and that it is bounded in this very dense concentration of people and residentially and commercially. When you move outside of that, um, it can be hard to identify the community um, because all that's really left are the intangible social networks, the family connections, friend of a friend of a friend, uh, social media networks. It can be hard both as an insider and even as an outsider to kind of figure out who all is included and who isn't because it's not necessarily based on where they live anymore. Um, so in this sense, Concentrations of Chinese American businesses in shopping centers and business parks are what provide the physical representations of the larger complex community around it, more so than um, if it was in an enclave. It becomes almost more important because there isn't the physical concentration like so densely because they're spread out. These are the only concentrations um, that are really recognizable. Um, so, and DFW Chinatown is one of these places. It calls itself a Chinatown and it is in Richardson. It was established in the 1980s as one of, after one of the uh, primary waves of the larger community. 
um, I guess it was quite small in DFW until about the 80s when Texas Instruments established itself in Richardson and it became a huge draw for immigrants to come directly to DFW rather than going through California or New York and eventually making their way to the middle of the um, country. So, um, so when it was established in the 80s, uh, it became really a marker that there, that there was a community here. There was a community center established uh, in the last 10 years or so. It's really rebranded, um, like the center has been rebranded uh, to say DFW Chinatown, to have statues, to look nice and look Chinese in some way. Um, but even though it calls itself a Chinatown, it's still, we can't really say that there's an ethnic enclave because it's a shopping mall. Uh, it's a small shopping strip and it's focused very much on Asian businesses. Uh, not so much the residential thing. It's a place for people to come and interact with the community from all over DFW. However, it's not necessarily where all the Chinese people live. It simply demonstrates that there are people around here, that there is a culture here, that there is a way that you can interact with all of it. Um, and when talking about the ethnic economy, which this is an example of it, um, the ethnic economy really just refers to all of the businesses that are owned or operated by members of a particular ethnic group. And uh, specifically, well, one of the key characteristics of it is that um, business goes through co-ethnic ties in some way, that that is a large part of how um, business is conducted. Um, so either by getting patrons between, um, between businesses and business networking, uh, getting employees also to work, all of that goes through uh, a shared background and that is how they will find people or they connect through those methods. Um, however, usually it's only considered to encompass small businesses. So some really, you could say, oh, well, it's only the small areas. It's only DFW Chinatown, or oh, it's only the 99 Ranch Plaza in Plano. It's only um, the Jusco Marketplace that's right around the corner from 99 Ranch Plaza. It's only those spaces. Uh, and you wouldn't include the large tech companies or any of the more public firms. Um, and a lot of that is also tied into ideas of, well, it's already assimilated. So it's lost its ethnic identity because it is part of the mainstream now. There's no reason to identify them as Chinese um, or the business as Chinese just because the people are. Um, however, a lot of these firms, there's clear evidence that some of the business associations that they're a part of, such as the US China uh, Chamber of Commerce, Commerce Dallas, uh, they specifically go through co-ethnic ties to um, connect with one another, as well as promote uh, DFW as a place of investment to Chinese investors. And they paint it as a place that Chinese people specifically will really like. Um, and I mean, they do. All the people that I spoke to in informal interviews during my participant observation, um, they all highlighted a lot of reasons why they specifically liked DFW. And a lot of it had to do with economic opportunities. They felt that they had more chances to own their own businesses. They had more space from people. They had more opportunities to find good schools, to work at good places, to go to good colleges without feeling smothered. Um, or like there was just too much competition from other people. It was like in the Goldilocks zone of competition for a lot of them. Um, so even so, of course, so since these firms are going through the co-ethnic ties to do this, um, that falls under the ethnic economy. So in that sense, I don't think you could say that they're completely assimilated, but it, this is breaking um, what we think about assimilation, um, both in a social sense, and they're not losing their identity, but also in an economic sense, and that the ethnic economy isn't something that's completely separate. It's not bound to just this one little neighborhood in Richardson or this one little neighborhood in Plano, or that's the only place that you see any of these. It is, um, it is woven into the whole economy of DFW. You just see concentrations of it in certain places. But if you blink, you'd miss it uh, at the same time. So it's both there and not there. It's prominent, but also like woven into everything else. Um, some limitations to this study, of course, I totally think that this is a completely preliminary study. A lot of my research actually got very interrupted by uh, current world circumstances the specific circumstances of the pandemic and that it originated in China, I have no doubt 
uh, affected my rapport building process while I was doing participant observation and trying to get people to talk to me and uh, pick their brain on what they thought about this. Because on the one hand, I have really cannot speak Chinese and I did not have access to a reliable translator, which I already knew was going to limit some of my information. But that in combination with fears about why a stranger was asking them about a community when they were already potentially experiencing anti-Chinese sentiment, um, even if it was very indirectly, I'm sure made it hard for people to really trust what I was saying, no matter how I said it. Um, and I actually think that um, the most interesting part of this research will really come after the pandemic has passed, because um, there are so many Chinese American entrepreneurs. There is a very prominent ethnic economy in that sense. And the economic impact of current events is certainly going to, to affect them, as well as the social impact of um, where the disease originated. And I um, can't think of the word, but um, not misinterpretations, but uh, yeah, like not misinformation about how the pandemic has spread and who has spread it and um, kind of even going back and forth between, well, you're completely assimilated, but now you're suddenly an outsider again in that sort of way, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that's gonna be a really interesting um, thing to look at, probably terribly interesting. Um, but I think especially looking at the economic impact is really going to show a lot about the social impact because I think those two are completely related. A lot of times we kind of ignore the human factor in the economy and tend to just look at it as a little bit of um, the numbers and statistics of who's owning what and who's doing um, certain things. But I think really what it reflects is just the um, social interactions that are actually going on and it just codifies it and puts it into um, a system we can all look at. But um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, excellent. Oh, if I, I, I also didn't mention, I'm a China scholar. So oh, perfect. <laughs> know a little bit about China. Uh, uh, so uh, that's fascinating. Uh, and and I've, I know a little bit about the history of Chinese and DFW, just a bit. Um, uh, and and uh, you're, you're absolutely right. There were Chinese in the middle part of the United States back in the 1800s. Um, in fact, everybody's heard of the, the, the cherry, the, the Bing cherry. Mm -hmm. yeah? The Bing cherry is named after the guy who developed the varietal. His name was Ah Bing. He was Cantonese. He lived in Colorado. Uh, back in a what 1901. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of that uh, uh, history that's hidden. Uh, the Chinese call it wild history. Anyway, um, excellent. So who has a question for our first presenter? Let's go in order. Well, I have um, a question then. If you don't yeah. have any questions. Absolutely. Okay. You have a lot going on in your project. It's yeah, a, so very a topic. big project, yeah. Uh, and there's a there there's a uh, there's a ton of acronyms that any audience has to absorb in order to really get up to speed. Uh, yes. Go ahead. I yeah. Um, within our um, within my degree field, it's it's um, one of like the beginnings of every. Every course, we start off like the first day of classes, the teacher kind of, uh, you know, throughout their lectures, throughout the rest of the semester, so we can kind of try to keep up to speed. But yeah, <laughs> definitely a lot me, of acronyms. Uh, a, a very, very long time ago, I was in the military, and the first two weeks were learning acronyms to the point that where I wanted to shoot everybody. Uh, it's almost impossible. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, but there are there, there's a lot going on there, and I I have a a, a very simple question. It took until about uh, I don't know seven to ten minutes into your presentation before I had a sense of who the stakeholders were. Right. Yes. And since your yeah. argument relies a, a fair amount on the idea that stakeholders should have a say, and rather should they should not be an afterthought, 
maybe you can give us a sense of who the stakeholders were in the Colorado case. Absolutely. So um, in, <clears throat> um, in Durango, Silverton area specifically, um, within the urban communities, it's a fairly um, highly educated um, communities that reside in these small, um, small communities there. Um, and the stakeholders, um, so a citizens advisory group is um, representatives throughout a community that um, come together um, to help, um, in this case, the EPA and the other federal agencies in the response and recovery efforts to identify community needs. So it's almost sort of like a, uh, like a parent, uh, you know, for schools, for elementary schools, when parents are involved in, you know, what um, initiatives need to go on within the school to help their children. It's kind of the same concept of, um, of a citizens advisory group where these different representatives throughout a community come together to um, help identify community needs. That way, instead of like having a forum where um, everyone from the whole community come and spouts off a bunch of like uh, issues that they believe are going on, um, it's a little bit more structured um, and um, has an ability to identify issues a little more strategically. But um, in this case, the Citizens Advisory Group, um, they are active stakeholders of the Superfund site. And the committee representatives are either specialists in agriculture, mining, mine remediation, recreation, environment, science, local government, or public health um, in this case. And so each one of these um, representatives that I interviewed, um, they are a specialist in one of those fields. Um, and okay. yeah. so, so you, you're actually interviewing people who are all topic specialists, right? Yes. So you, yes. what you're doing is you're, cre you're skimming the cream of the crop of all the possible stakeholders off the top and you're not you're not getting a, a, a broad spectrum kind of Joe Joe on the street kind of uh, uh, you know the the barber in Silverton is not going to be on your uh, your interview list I get it okay uh, that makes sense it's probably better off when you present this uh, in the future you want to be very clear about who your stakeholder sample is Absolutely. Uh, because uh, that that will matter a great deal to your audience It'll also allow you to connect with your audience a little bit better. Yeah, uh, but uh, I, I think your your uh, your argument that your method, the ARMC method, uh, is an improvement over the previous method, uh, hinges on the success or failure of those stakeholders to not think that they are or not feel in your case it's you're actually articulating a feeling rather than a thought um, uh, uh, to, to not think that they're an afterthought um, and that that's a that's a hard uh, a hard sell uh, so uh, but very interesting stuff um, uh, and if we're, if we're talking about all of the super fun sites in the country that you, you have your work cut out for you this is great yeah, I um, I actually did this um, project in um, sort of like a practice run for my master's thesis. So this is definitely something that I'm going to expound upon um, within the next few years for sure. Excellent. Um, but the the overall uh, intent is to make um, a a more um, strategic survey. So like from this, it was more of a baseline kind of gathering all my information, gathering all my thoughts of like, what could possibly work um, to address these issues. Um, that way I can narrow down on specific um, 
quantifiable questions in a survey and we can disperse those to um, federal agency workers and uh, the stakeholders to kind of get more of a overall picture of the data collected. Okay. Um, and then from that we can kind of pinpoint corrections to the adaptive management approach and maybe throw in, you know, the um, identified structure of each step um, a little more in depth. All right, well done. Very nice. Um, Thank you. Okay, Kelly, uh, we're, we're a little crunched for time. So, uh, um, Kelly, um, does anybody have any questions for Kelly? No? Kelly, I have a question. It in your read, this is fabulous, by the way, very interesting kind of research. Uh, your, it seems to me your access to this information is remarkable. Even, even though you're, you methodologically claim that you just looked at chat groups, these people really seem to want to talk. They were telling you a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, that's impressive. Um, uh, uh, now, you rely on Foucault a great deal. So I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. In Foucault's Discipline and Punish, which you cite, uh, uh, you, you actually make an argument about how these uh, neoliberal impulses in the form of therapeutic communities in prisons, it, you suggest that they're damaging, that they're demoralizing, that they're in fact at times torture, and that the, 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 the human creation that is the result of them is um, fundamentally dysfunctional, fundamentally problematic, maybe even damaging. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally fine with that argument. I don't, I don't find that even a little bit problematic. Okay. But what I, and I, and in, in real honest terms, I find it compelling. I find your, your conclusion compelling. But what I, what I am a little bit unclear about is who did Foucault say that these disciplining actions, that these, what really are a kind of micro sociologics of power, um, who do they work on? Because it wasn't clear to me. They work on everybody. They, they, they work on everybody. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, they work on everybody. For Foucault, power is like almost like an elemental force, kind of like mana. It's like always flowing around and stuff. And where I was going with this research was kind of an intervention on the existing research that's been done that mainly focuses on more of like Foucault's later works that are addressing things called like subjectivation and how getting how uh, governments and, and structures of power get people to take up the project of governing themselves and controlling themselves without anybody standing over them and telling them to do it, but just by creating a system where really in all honesty, it's an environmental intervention. So you will decide to act a certain way because that's kind of the best option that you see. And yeah. I saw that in the literature, people were focusing so much on this self technology, the self work, and that they kind of glossed over the use of discipline. And where my research kind of intersects is between these two kind of poles of social control that are discipline in this kind of a immediate link between punishment and or between crime or like an act that's not normal or is against a normative judgment like how to sit or how to stand and then also this kind of uh, drive to make yourself a better person and then you're going to be successful despite all the things outside of it which is a very neoliberal concept you know and i was yeah. discipline pushing people through even whenever they would realize like this treatment style makes no sense to me. It's not going to help me. I know that I'm going to face all these barriers when I get out, but I'm afraid that if I leave, I know I'm going to be punished even more. And also I'm afraid that I'm not going to have good chances at controlling my future afterwards. Yeah. That was my critique there. It's actually you, your argument recapitulates Foucault's fundamental argument in Discipline and Punish. Now, I know all of the Foucauldians want you to think that you really, really need to read all of Foucault's later works in order to really get what he was talking about. That's bullshit. Um, you can actually read Discipline and Punish and get the entire body of his work if you read it carefully. All you need to do is re recognize his, his model for Panopticon. He uses that prison model for Panopticon. 
The yeah. point of that model is not so that he can condition the prisoners. It's not so he can, can, he can make these prisoners better prisoners or, or a different kind of thinking human. The, the point of the model is that the public is supposed to be able to go in and look out from that center pole at all of the prisoners and the guards. Okay, that's the key. Everybody forgets that about, about Foucault, but it's to condition the public, not it's to, con to condition the public to be the panoptic servants and to get condition the guards to think that they're always being surveilled. Um, not the prisoners, they're screwed already. They know that they're being surveilled. Uh, it's the guards that he's worried about. And he gets this model directly from Jeremy Bentham, by the way, he didn't, he didn't come up with it. Uh, uh, so you, you, can, you can track that down and get everything you need for this particular argument, which is very nice, by the way, in Discipline and Punish. It's all in that one book. Actually, it's all in the first third of that one book. I think so, something, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's hard to have things pause. It's hard to tell when someone's talking or stopping to talk. So I think the cool thing about this project was that it was actually drawing his later works on like neoliberal governance and uh, governmentality frameworks. And then it actually kind of pushes these two together because it's, both, it's using both of these as a means of control or a means of uh, trying to incite people to take responsibility, responsibility for everything at once. Okay, uh, excellent. I've, uh, I've, we've only got a couple of minutes left and, and uh, uh, Danielle, I, 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 I have very little to say about yours except that you have a very straightforward argument. It's that this thing exists, right? That there is an ethno verb, that there is an ethnic economy, right? And you do a, a masterful job of describing it. And uh, you don't have so much to overcome in terms of conceptual argument, uh, except maybe uh, your, your idea of what assimilation is. It's not really clear, but that's yeah. not, it's not really your fault. It's because nobody's really clear about that. Um, and uh, what exactly an ethnic economy is rather than an economy or, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's all like similar to the argument about culture. Nobody's really sure what that means. Some people don't want to talk about it at all. Um, but uh, because we're so out of time now, um, uh, I'm, I, I apologize. I didn't manage time very well. Um, but I would encourage you, if you're interested, uh, to, send, to send me how, this, how your paper develops. And, and send it to me, because I'm interested in this stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm a China guy, but I don't know that much about Chinese in, in uh, 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 Dallas-Fort Worth. Hardly uh, anybody does, it's fine. Yeah. So, but your paper was fabulous, very informative. I'm, I'm very happy that I got to, got to hear your presentation. In fact, I read it, so I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> Uh, uh, to, to have read it. That's good. Uh, my, but, my paper makes a better argument than I just did today, honestly. But. <laughs> You did very well. Don't worry. Thank you. To be commended. In fact, you're all to be commended. You did very well. And we have to go now. So uh, <laughs> I, I apologize. Okay. Have, have a wonderful day. You'll Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.